Now today, we are diving into the 34th chapter of 2 Chronicles. Over the past two months, we have been working our way through 1 and 2 Chronicles. These books are one of two historical accounts in the Bible that tell the story of the monarchy in Judah, Judah over a period of 450 years. The Chronicles story begins with a man named David. And after David, it follows the exploits of his sons and descendants as they reign on the throne in Jerusalem. The chapter that we are discussing today is the story of David's distant descendant, a man named Josiah. Now, King Josiah reigned over Judah for about 30 years in the late 7th century BCE. His time on the throne came to an end sometime around 610 BC, or about 400 years after the reign of David began. In addition to those dates, there is one other date that we need to pay close attention to when we read the books of Chronicles. That date is somewhere around 350 BCE. This is when the author of Chronicles wrote the story that we are about to read. And as we listen to the story of King Josiah, we must remember that these words that we are about to read are written some 250 years after the death of Josiah. The last thing we need to acknowledge before we get to the text is that in 350 BCE, the author of Chronicles writes the story of King Josiah with a very specific and a very clear agenda in mind. The author wants every reader of this work to believe that the temple in Jerusalem should be prioritized over all other forms of religious expression. The author believes that this elevation of religion will forge a stronger national identity in the author's day, which is 350 BCE. Because in that day, the author's day, the pressing theological question that the people of Judah kept asking was, are we still the people of God? The answer is the thesis of Chronicles, which is, of course, we are still the people of God because we have the temple. The thesis of Chronicle is Judah's religious identity is the temple of Jerusalem. And if Judah wants to become a stronger, more unified nation, then Judah, according to the author of Chronicles, must prioritize the centrality of the religious establishment in Jerusalem. Whenever we open the book of Chronicles, we need to remember the author's thesis whenever we read a story from the author's pages. Now, there is nothing wrong with a biblical author writing with an agenda or a thesis in mind. But there is something wrong when we read the books of the Bible today and never pause to ask ourselves the question, what is the author's central point in this written work? So this story of Josiah is part of a larger framework meant to convince the reader that the temple is a religious organization ordained and championed by the creator of the universe. Let's keep that in mind as we experience the story of Josiah as told by the author of Chronicles. We read, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Okay, hold up. An eight-year-old king as a nation's head of state? Really? Can you imagine if we had an eight-year-old in the White House today? I mean, that eight-year-old president would throw a temper tantrum if they were democratically voted out by the American people. I assume that this child would pout and declare that the whole election that this child just lost is completely rigged and that child would refuse to accept that defeat. I mean, having a child in the White House would be just a total disaster, wouldn't it? Now, the reason that Josiah becomes king when he is eight years old is because his father, Ammon, became king at the age of 22. Two years into Ammon's reign, assassins brutally murdered Ammon at the age of 24. However, royal guards quickly squashed the assassins, the assassins and their mutiny and placed the crown on the boy Josiah's head. Now, the people of Judah are not completely insane. Most likely, Josiah had several advisors and government officials 
that ran the country for him until he reached the age of 16, which we'll read about in a moment. The text continues, Josiah reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And Josiah walked in the ways of his ancestor David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. My friends, when the author of Chronicles tells us that Josiah did what was right, we need to remember the thesis statement of Chronicles, which is Judah's religious identity is the temple of Jerusalem. Because the author declares that Josiah is a good king at the beginning of Josiah's story, we can make a well-educated guess that Josiah is going to prioritize the authority and religious praxis at the temple in Jerusalem. If he didn't do these things during his reign, then the author of Chronicles would not refer to Josiah as a righteous king. In fact, throughout all of Chronicles, the author passes judgment on each and every king and queen in Judah's history based on their willingness to acknowledge and enable the temple's authority. So there is very little surprise when we continue reading, for in the eighth year of Josiah's reign, while he was still a boy, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor David. Four years later, in the twelfth year of his reign, Josiah began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the sacred poles, and the carved and the cast images. So here we have a 20-year-old king leading a massive religious reform that basically outlaws all religions in the land except for one religion, which is Josiah's religion, which is centered around the temple. Verses 4 and 5 say more about this reform. In his presence, they pulled down the altars of the Baals. He demolished the incense altars that stood above them. Josiah broke down the sacred poles and the carved and the cast images. Josiah made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Josiah also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and purged Judah and Jerusalem. Yikes! In this verse, the religious reform takes a rather gruesome turn. The text is unclear as to whether these bones are from priests who are already dead or they are bones from priests who are executed by Josiah, but either way, bones being burned is a statement from a tyrant. Josiah publicly announces an intolerance for other religions, with fire fueled from the bones of religious minorities. While we are frightened by the actions of this unchecked king, the author of Chronicles appreciates and celebrates Josiah's willingness to burn bones, because the author of Chronicles believes that this statement is necessary to establish the authority of the temple. Now, six years later, Josiah is in the 18th year of his reign and is 26 years old. To continue his religious reform, he gathers three messengers in his royal court, Shaphan, Joah, and Maaseah. He then gives them a pile of cash then tells his messengers to take this pile of cash to the priests at the temple and to spend this money on the restoration and repair of that temple. Obviously, the author of Chronicles loves that Josiah pays an enormous sum of money to the religious officials. So the three messengers go up to the temple and ask, hey, does anyone here want a giant pile of cash? Hilkiah, the high priest, begins to jump up and down as he says, I do, I do, I want a giant pile of cash. And with that money in hand, Hilkiah, the high priest, and the people of Judah completely renovate the temple. We read all about how Judah came together to work on this sacred structure. The text tells us about how happy and joyful all of the workers were as they labored under the guidance and leadership of the priests. While they were cleaning out the temple, the religious leaders discover a scroll in a back room. Now, the author of Chronicles describes this scroll as the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Now, scholars are in near unanimous agreement as to what this scroll most likely is. Dr. Bernard Levison from the University of Minnesota writes, scholars, 
both traditional and critical, have long identified the scroll of the Torah discovered in Josiah's temple as the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible today, which means that the discovery of this scroll directly impacted the shape of our scriptures in our Bible. Immediately, Shaphan returns to the court of King Josiah and tells Josiah of the stunning discovery of the book of Deuteronomy. Shaphan then unfurls the scroll and begins to read passages of scripture that King Josiah has never heard before. Now, Deuteronomy is a lengthy book, so I'd like to pick just a few select passages from this book and try to help all of us imagine what Josiah felt hearing these words for the first time. In chapter 12, we read, Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place you happen to see. Now, upon hearing these words, I imagine Josiah's stomach turning tightly into knots. He probably thought, uh-oh, my people have not been following this. His people were offering sacrifices to God throughout the land. But here, Deuteronomy says you can only offer sacrifices at a central location, which is the temple. The second passage I'd like for us to look at is from chapter 17 of Deuteronomy. We read, when the king has taken the throne of his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law, being Deuteronomy, written for him in the presence of the Levitical priests. This law shall remain with the king, and he shall read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, diligently observing all the words of this law and these statutes. Now, I picture Josiah hearing this passage and feeling a wave of panic in his soul. As the king, he has not been reading Deuteronomy all the days of his life because, you know, he just found out that Deuteronomy exists. He probably thought to himself, uh-oh, I haven't been reading Deuteronomy every day. The third passage is from chapter 23. We read, you shall have a designated area outside the camp to which you shall go. With your utensils, you shall have a trowel. When you relieve yourself outside, you shall dig a hole with it and then cover up your excrement. Now, this one really flusters Josiah, and he thinks, uh-oh, I have been using the royal latrine. And apparently, the royal latrine is a sin. We keep reading. From there, we go to chapter 28, and we read, If you do not diligently observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, fearing this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God then the lo will overwhelm both you and your offspring with severe and lasting afflictions and grievous and lasting maladies. Josiah squirms as he considers these gruesome and lasting maladies. He thinks, uh-oh, we haven't been following the words and law that are in this book. Another selection from Deuteronomy 31, Moses commanded them every seventh year in the scheduled year of remission during the festival of booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Josiah hangs his head in shame. He wonders aloud, oh no, we haven't been reading this book out loud every seven years. A little later in that same chapter, Shaphan reads to Josiah, Moses commanded them, take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. Let it remain there as a witness against you. Josiah groans, oh no, this book has not been kept next to the Ark. Instead, this book has been in a basement since who knows when. So Shaphan reads the entire book of Deuteronomy to King Josiah. And the words of Deuteronomy greatly distress the king. So much so that Josiah tears his clothes as a sign of protest against himself and his own people. He then summons the high priest, Hilkiah, as well as three other messengers and commands them to seek out a prophet from God who can help them in their plight. The five messengers rush to the prophetess Holda, as recreated here by photographer James C. Lewis. 
The messengers quickly explained to Hulda that they found a scroll in a basement, and this scroll contained all kinds of laws that the people of Judah continually broke for generations. So then these messenger, messengers lean in close and ask Hulda, Hulda, what can we do to seek forgiveness from God for breaking all of the rules in Deuteronomy? Hulda sits silently. The messengers desperately want this prophetess to speak. But they know it's a bad idea to make a prophetess angry. Finally, Hulda speaks. And she delivers some terrible news. Thus says the Lord, she says, I will indeed bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book that was, uh, that was read before the king of Judah. Because Judah has forsaken me and has made offerings to other gods, so that they have provoked me to anger with all the works of their hands. My wrath, being God's wrath, will be poured out on this place, and my wrath will not be quenched. Hulda then goes on to tell the messengers that God will spare Josiah of this wrath in his lifetime because Josiah expressed sincere remorse for his nation's inability to keep the law of Deuteronomy. The five messengers then take Hulda's message back to King Josiah. And for the next 12 years, Josiah continues to enforce massive religious reform that will come to define his time and power. He reinstates the celebration of the Passover. He hunts down and destroys any and all religious structures that are not endorsed by the priests of the temple. And he devoutly strives to live by the standards and laws in the book of Deuteronomy. At the age of 39, Josiah is killed on the battlefield. His death is recorded in 2 Chronicles 35, which is the second to last chapter in Chronicles. Chapter 36 covers the reign of four kings. Three of them are Josiah's sons, and one is Josiah's grandson. All four kings are deemed to be evil by the author of Chronicles. And after their fourth evil king in a row, the author tells us that God no longer has a choice about what God has to do. According to the text, God sends an invading army from Babylon. The Babylonians rout the people of Judah in 586 BCE. This happens about 25 years after the reign of Josiah. Now, the majority of the survivors of this routing are then dragged back across the desert and forced to live in exile for the next 47 years. This exile is a cataclysmic level of national suffering, the likes of which I have never known in my lifetime. Here's how the author of Chronicles writes about this unspeakable tragedy. The Lord, the God of Judah's ancestors, sent persistently to them messengers because God had compassion on God's people and on God's dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising God's words and scoffing at God's prophets until the wrath of the Lord against God's people became so great that there was no remedy. Therefore, God brought up against them the king of Babylon who killed their youths with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or young woman, the aged or the feeble. God gave them all into Babylon's hand. This story is emotionally devastating. This exile is the most influential and tragic event in all of the Hebrew Bible. Whenever we suffer in life, human beings always ask the question, why is this happening? We ask this question because there are types of suffering that are preventable. If we can understand why we suffered, then maybe we can make different choices in the future that would prevent us from suffering in the same way again in the future. However, while there is suffering that is preventable, there is also suffering that is unpreventable. And sometimes the question why can lead us to determine that nothing else could have been done to prevent the tragedy that we encountered. 
The author of Chronicles believes that this suffering, the suffering of exile, was entirely preventable. So when people ask the question, why did God allow the exile to happen? We look back through the pages and see that the prophetess, Hulda, already clearly explained why this happened. The prophetess informs us that God's only option left in God's relationship with Judah was violence. The reason for this is a sequence of seven different events in this story. So let's recap what those events are. Some time ago, the book of Deuteronomy is written. Assuming Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy, that would place event number one at some time around the year 1300 BCE. After Deuteronomy is written, Deuteronomy is lost. We do not know how or when these writings ended up being misplaced, but the text records that they are later found in a storage room in the temple. Just for fun, let's assume that Deuteronomy is lost 200 years after it is written. So sometime around the year 1100 BCE. After Deuteronomy is lost, Deuteronomy is unintentionally disobeyed by the children of Israel. This makes sense because a lot of the rules in Deuteronomy are not intuitive. For example, we read a law, or we read a law earlier that Deuteronomy needs to be read every seven years. Well, that's a difficult law to keep unless you possess a copy of Deuteronomy that's telling you, make sure that you read Deuteronomy every seven years. So the children of Israel are breaking the law of God, but none of them know that they are actually breaking the law of God because they don't have a copy of the law of God. This leads to step four. The wrath of God grows exponentially with each passing generation as they fail to follow the rules that they do not know exist. Now, what I find interesting about this step in the story is that God, who many profess to be all powerful, chooses not to bring the scroll forward and place it in a king's hand. Instead, God apparently stews in the corner of heaven as God wonders why no one will take the time to find the rules that they are making God so incredibly angry. And assuming that Deuteronomy was lost in 1100 BCE, God's wrath grows at an alarming pace for 500 years until during the reign of Josiah, Deuteronomy is found. Upon hearing Deuteronomy, Josiah realizes that the people of Judah are a long way off from upholding the law of God as outlined in Deuteronomy. Josiah tears his clothes in protest and immediately preaches, reaches out to the prophetess Hulda. Hulda, he inquires, can we do anything to right this massive wrong and earn God's favor for not following the law in Deuteronomy? Hulda says no. She informs Josiah that God's wrath from the past 500 years is past the point of no return. She prophesies to Josiah that God will send a violent conquest to Jerusalem in the very near future to teach Judah a lesson. This lesson is that Judah should have known better and kept the law that they did not know existed. 25 years later, God's anger comes into tangible reality and the conquest and the exile is interpreted as an act of God. This is the theology and testimony of the actions and character of God as recorded in Scripture. Take a moment and consider Josiah and Hulda's story from a bird's eye perspective like this one. I think all of us need to sit with this story and consider the actions of God. And after we sit with this story for some time, I feel that a necessary question must be asked. The question we have to ask is in this story, is God actually good? Now you may have a strong reaction to this question. You may feel with deep conviction that God is very good in this story or that God is very bad in this story. But before we answer that question, I wanna tell you a hypothetical story to help all of us answer this question. Let's project a thought experiment onto a real relationship from today's world. A little over 10 years ago, I married my best friend, Kimmy. Before we go any further, I wanna remind you 
all of you that what I'm about to tell you is a hypothetical story projected onto my marriage. This marriage is very real, but the story we will project onto it is not. So let's imagine 2 Chronicles 34 in the context of my marriage. Imagine with me that Kimmy loves getting flowers from me. Flowers are so important to her that on our wedding day, in our hypothetical world, Kimmy decides to write me a letter expressing how much flowers will be critical to the health of our marriage going forward. So she writes on a card, Dearest Craig, I love getting flowers from you. Please bring me flowers every day, or I will murder your walking partner, Bella. Love, Kimmy. XO, XO, XO. XO. Now, right before our wedding, Kimmy seeks me out and hands me this card in a sealed envelope. She tells me, hey, Craig, don't forget to read this card. It's really important to me. Now, I promise Kimmy I will read it. Then the wedding happens. We dine with friends and family at the reception. We say goodbye to everyone. We go to the hotel room and poof, I somehow forget all about the card with these important instructions. Kimmy's card stays in the jacket pocket of my wedding suit, unopened and unread. The next day, our first day as a married couple, comes and goes, and there are no flowers. Kimmy is disappointed. But rather than confronting me and asking me if I read the card, she thinks to herself, he should know that this card is important to me. So he needs to remember the card on his own, he needs to find that card for himself, and then he needs to bring me flowers every day. Otherwise, I will have no choice but to murder our dog. The second day of marriage passes, no flowers. The third day, no flowers. Our first anniversary arrives, and I've managed to not bring Kimmy flowers for 365 days in a row. Our second anniversary, still no flowers. Time flies by our third, fourth, and fifth anniversary, and still there are no flowers for five years straight. With each passing anniversary, Kimmy becomes more frustrated, more disappointed, and more convinced that I need to pay the price for not following her basic instructions. I take Kimmy to some nice dinners on our sixth and seventh anniversaries, but all Kimmy can think about is, I don't want dinner, Craig, I want flowers. Our eight-year anniversary is spent at the spaghetti factory with our two kids. Kimmy tells Maya and Bodhi that Daddy is going to bring flowers for the first time on our eighth anniversary. She meets me at the restaurant, and her heart drops when she realizes that I am sitting there without any flowers. Our ninth anniversary is spent over FaceTime, so Kimmy assumes I will have flowers delivered to the house. She sits on the porch, eagerly waiting for her flowers to show up, and she goes to bed flowerless and disappointed. Our 10th anniversary falls on a Saturday, so Kimmy casually suggests that I should wear my wedding suit when I preach. I happily oblige. As I am putting on the suit, I notice something bulky in my jacket pocket. I reach in and discover an aged card in a sealed envelope. I panic as I remember the moment that she gave me this card on our wedding day. With hands trembling, I fear the worst. And the worst is what's in that card. I read, Dearest Craig, I love getting flowers from you. Please bring me flowers every day or I will murder your walking partner, Bella, which is our dog. I race downstairs to find Kimmy. With tears in my eyes, I say, Kimmy, I'm so sorry. I just found the card and I know how you wanted flowers. I had no idea. I love you and I'll order flowers for you right now. And every day, I, I, every day you'll have flowers and I'm so sorry. And please, 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 just don't murder Bella. And Kimmy stands up as tall as she can. And as she yells, it's too late, Craig. You should have known better. My wrath is past the point of no return. Kimmy then pulls out a knife from the kitchen drawer. She walks over to Bella. She yells, you must learn a lesson, Craig. I want flowers. And then Kimmy stabs Bella. And Bella is no more. I have a
a question I would like to ask you. In this hypothetical story, is Kimmy a good spouse? Absolutely not. Hypothetical Kimmy acts immorally in this story. Debate over. We don't have to sit around and talk about whether she was justified in murdering the dog. With that story in mind, let's return to our pressing question. In the story of Josiah and Hulda, is God actually good? Absolutely not. No way. Debate is over. In this story, God's actions are those of a tyrant. God is petty. God is cruel. God is vengeful. And God is not worthy of any form of worship, respect, or honor. In this story, God is immoral. Which is why this story is such a difficult story. Whether we like it or not, this story takes Christians in America today and drops them off at a crossroads. In regards to this story, Christians must decide between the following two options. The first option is, the Bible is always true. The second option is, God is always moral. Now, Christians don't like this. But the fact is that these two ideas are mutually exclusive. This mutual exclusion becomes transparent when we carefully read the story of Josiah and Huldah. Now, this is just one of many stories in the Bible that continually lead us back to these crossroads and asks us the question, do you believe that the Bible is always true? Or do you believe that God is always moral? Because these roads are mutually exclusive. It is impossible to walk down both at the same time. Now here is what is truly stunning about Christians in America today. When Christians arrive at these crossroads and they are given the choice between the accuracy of the Bible and the morality of God, the overwhelming majority of Christians choose to uphold the accuracy of the Bible at the expense of the morality of God. Now, if we pause and think about this for a moment, this decision to go down that road is rather stunning. Christians across America would rather have an accurate Bible and an immoral God than an inaccurate Bible and a moral God. The reason I believe that Christians feel this way is because Christians today are more concerned about being right than we are concerned about being good. If you do not believe me, then think about how the majority of the church acts toward queer people. When Christians outside of paradox find out that we are a fully affirming, fully marrying, and fully ordaining queer uh, church, the number one follow-up question we receive is, well, have you read the Bible? To which we reply, yes, yes, we have read the Bible. We are here every week reading the Bible. We read the Bible all the time. At which most Christians follow up question to us saying that we do read the Bible is something along the lines of, well, how can you support same-sex marriage if that will not be allowed in heaven? Do you understand what is happening when people say this to us? This question is an accusation. And the Christian who is asking this question is accusing us of being more accepting, more inclusive, and more loving than God. How on earth can someone be led to the insane idea that someone like me is more accepting, inclusive, and loving than God? The only logical answer is that Christians are more concerned about being right than we are about being good. This prioritization leads Christians to act much like God does in the story of Josiah and Huldah. Namely, Christians become petty, vengeful, angry, and suspicious of other human beings. Which is why we need to rearrange what is important to us. And Christians need to stop being concerned about being right more than we are concerned about being good and instead, Christians need to be more concerned about being good than we are concerned about being right. 
In our society today, we have a terrible definition of faith. Most people think that faith is the ability to believe in ridiculous things. But that definition, by that very definition, flat earthers are great people of faith. Anytime that flat earthers are portrayed as great people, then you know that your definition of what makes them great is in trouble. Because we live in a round world. If you don't believe me, then please don't use the GPS on your phone because GPS needs the world to be round in order to work. Flat earthers are not people of great faith. We need a different and better definition of faith. For me, faith is what we trust about the character of God. And one of the most radical things that you and I can do with our faith is to fully believe with reckless abandon, that God is always moral. That God is always good. That God is always love. When we place our faith in the benevolence of God's character, that, as well as placing our faith that God's work in this world is to make all things good, that is the moment when our faith changes from the inside out. Rather than viewing people outside of our religion with suspicion, we sit at their feet as they teach us about God. Rather than seeing racial injustice as a worldly inconvenience, we work toward racial equality knowing it will be the cornerstone of the kingdom of God. Rather than attempting to sit on the throne of God and declare who's in and who's out of heaven, we will humble ourselves and serve those who are in need. Rather than viewing a mask as an infringement on our rights, we will gladly wear a mask to participate in the betterment of public health for each other. Rather than clinging to our fragile eagles, e egos, we will learn how to apologize, how to reconcile, and how to make amends with those we have wronged and those who have wronged us. My friends, I told a hypothetical story about my wife murdering our dog. I hope this story felt jarring to you because many of you personally know my wife and you know that how she acted in the hypothetical story could not be further from the truth as to the actual person that is Kimmy. Now imagine that 10 years down the road, someone told you this hypothetical story about Kimmy to you. But when they told you this hypothetical story, the person telling you the story believes that this story is somehow actual, factual, historical, and accurate. How would you respond to that person telling you the story? I think you might say, hmm, it's not the Kimmy I know. My hope is that by the end of this sermon today, you will hear the story of Josiah and Huldah. And as soon as the story concludes, you will respond with clarity and courage by saying, this is not the God that I know. And you will feel confident in those words because you are a person of great faith and great faith trusts that God is abundantly good. To my friends this morning, may you trust that God is abundantly good. When you encounter stories of scripture that portray God as immoral, may you have the courage to say, this is not the God that I know. And may we find that life given to us by this creator is a gift to be enjoyed, even in the midst of a frightening pandemic. Because on the whole, the story of faith is that we believe in the good qualities of who God is. And may you see and embrace the abundance of goodness of Jesus Christ in all. Amen.